Welcome to Commander Central episode 235. And today, at the end of the year of Commander, when we've had way too many new cards to count, we're going to talk about making changes to our decks when new cards are released. I'm Dana. I'm Max. And I'm Chris. Friends, how's it going? It's Friday. The silence tells me uh, <laughs> you're, you're just trying to get by. Yeah, yep. Same exact thing every single day. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> We're all just trying to make it through till Christmas. Uh, I, I'm riding the high of the Marvel, the Disney Investor Conference, and the Video Game Awards from last night. So you know what? I, I am with that. you there. I fired that up last night too. Max, you sent me the link to the someone was streaming it on on YouTube, so I watched that as well. And yeah, I like I'm kind of hyped. I was like, oh, a bunch of new Star Wars content is coming. All the Marvel stuff was was pretty sweet to see. So uh, that put me in a good mood last night. I, well, I I'm on board with that for sure. Anyone uh, play any fun games of actual Commander this week? I think, did you get any in this week, Max? I did get to play one game uh, last weekend with Aaron Campbell, Andy Flurry from Guardian Project, and Adam. I don't remember his full name, but his name was Adam. We played Sunday afternoon. We got a game in, and somehow we let Andy win with Angry Omnath at four life. So that was fun. But everybody's <laughs> decks got to do their own thing, which, you know, that's kind of the goal sometimes when you play EDH. It's just to see your deck do its thing. And overall, it was a great game. Nice. I played a couple on EDH Recast stream on Wednesday. Um, we had Zanae Beckham on. Uh, she goes by Zvex on Twitter and Instagram and a little TikTok and wherever else she is. Um, really good cosplayer. So we played with her on Wednesday. And I played with a couple of the mods from the MTG Nexus uh, website last night um, on Twitch as well. Used to be, they used to all work for MTG, MTG Salvation back when that was one of the biggest magic websites, you know, a few years back. And that has now migrated over to Nexus, which I still use for some stuff. So I played with them last night and had a good time. Been very happy with my Krom and Ketis deck, which was my Adelaide stack and I've converted it over without really changing much else, just swapping the commanders. That's been a lot of fun. So I'm still enjoying that deck, and it kicked off last night. I got to do a, you know, drop Kedis and buff Krom and, you know, smack somebody, kill one person with 30 commander damage, and it, like, did 30 to everybody else simultaneously and knocked them all down to, like, three or four for easy mop-up in the turn after. So that deck's been real solid. I've enjoyed it. Gross. Anybody brewing anything or working on anything? Not right now. You're kind of in the you're kind of in the doldrums, Chris. It's kind of like the, the the time of year you're just not feeling particularly inspired. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff I want to do, but then it's like I look at it and I'm just uh, so melancholy and just <laughs> whatever. Well, you've also been like doing a lot of outside stuff too, because here very rarely in Wisconsin in the middle of December is it you know 35 or 40 degrees during the day with no snow on the ground, so you're actually able to go outside and do stuff. It was like 56 yesterday. Yeah, which yeah, was it's stupid. A, yeah, <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> So if you're someone who goes outside and does like outdoor stuff like you tend to do, this has been kind of nice for that at least. Yes, it has. And I think I'm just getting, I'm tired doing so much stuff <laughs> so often. It's just like I hear that. physical stuff. I just want to go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Max and I both have a couple of decks we've been working on for an upcoming uh, event with Scrap Trawlers on December 20th. Yeah, so we'll be streaming with them on December, Sunday, December 20th for their uh, monthly stream. It's a budget brew stream, so that's a little unique for my brewing methods. I'm not used to brewing on a budget. Me as well. But uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. We get to re unveil our decks at the stream. So I don't know what Dana, Andy, or Nick are building and vice versa for those three with me. But we are going to make a, a little announcement. And Andy and Nick, uh, when you hear this, surprise, Dana <laughs> and I are going to be giving away our decks that we play on stream. One will be given away during the raffles that we'll announce during the stream. And then the other one we'll give away here on our show. Uh, which deck we're giving away where, we do not know yet. Well, yeah. <laughs> that is it. Because we haven't announced even what the decks are yet. We'll do that yeah. on the stream and we'll kind of then figure it out which one we want to do. Maybe we'll give away the one that does better on their stream. And the, and the, the, the one that finishes in first place, obviously, <laughs> we can give away on their stream. The one that finishes in second place will probably be the one we'll, we'll give away on the show. Sweet. So mine is going to be given away on the <laughs> show. Um, <laughs> right, <yay>. right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that'll be fun. Looking forward to it. So right, a couple days before Christmas, you can tune in and watch us on a Sunday night. Yeah. And then I actually am figured out my 100 for my Abomination of Land War deck. Oh, you sent me the list the other day to take a look at. Yeah. Yeah. I Although I think I need to edit it, it definitely 
runs out of gas quickly. Henry Stukenberg did a lot of playtesting with it. He goes, you're running out of gas. It's hard to keep, you know, a full hand. So I might have to tinker with it before, you know, hitting that send to card kingdom button to purchase. It's a very creature heavy deck, if I remember correctly. Is that that's right? Yeah, there's 39 creatures in the deck and they're all, you know, under four CMC or even two CMC. It's elves. So, I mean, it's just elf ball. But if you can't refill your hand, there's not much to do. Take a look at Minion's Murmurs that draws you a card for each creature you control and you lose a life. That's true. That would be a decent one. And there's also a few things in green that do the same thing, but at least Murmurs is a little bit cheaper to cast. But a few of those, it would be a good deck for one of those things that care about creatures. So yeah, but yeah, it was, it was a good looking list. I'm looking forward to playing against it. Well, thank you. And you haven't ever built a goal. Oh, you had a Marin deck years ago, but like you haven't played Golgari aside from that, really. Nope. Yeah, I had a Marin deck when it first came out, and it, I did Marin things and tore it apart. <laughs> <laughs> well, this will play much differently than that, so. Yeah, to it. big time. Well, if you out there in listener land like to share with us what you've been up to or any new decks you're brewing, given the 70 plus legends we just got in Commander Legends, how would you go about doing that, Chris? You can find us on a multitude of social media platforms. You can find us on Twitter at CMDR Central. You can search us up on Facebook, CMDR Central. You can find us online at CMDRCentral.com. And you can also find us on YouTube by searching CMDR Central. You can also head over to patreon.com slash CMDR Central and check out our reward tiers, such as the Decks You Play series, are just uh, joining us in our Slack to talk Commander and pretty much anything else that's going on in life and be able to maybe get a game in with us. For sure. This week, we want to say thank you to the new patron, CJ Burns. Thank you very much, CJ, and thanks to all the patron supporters and for everyone who just supports us in general, just by listening or giving us an upvote or a like on whatever medium you use to listen to the show. Any kind of engagement makes a big difference, and we do really appreciate it, especially in this insane year of all years. So thank you, everyone. It's it's a big deal for making 2020 successful, successful as it could be, given it's been 2020. Yeah. Oof. <laughs> all right. So speaking of insane years, let's jump into the main topic, because it's been a crazy year just in terms of commander, you know, Theros Beyond Death, and then Jumpstart, then Akoria, and Corset 2021, which was an actual really fantastic corset. They've totally figured out how to make those really something to invest in, unlike, you know, in, in past years. Then Zendikar Rising, then Commander Legends. And in between all of that, we got nine <laughs> Commander Precon decks. We got a ton of reprints in Double Masters and Mystery Boosters. And we even got, like, weird side products like Game Nights and all the Secret Lair players, one of which had functionally unique cards, and things like Commander Collection Green, all of which got reprints out there in people's hands for cards that were either tough to find or in some cases really expensive, and some of those have now gone down in price. So that's a lot of potential changes to decks, and we wanted to talk about how we go about making changes to our decks, and hopefully that will be a little bit of use to, a little bit of use to people out there listening to the show. Before we get into the specifics here about making cuts, though, and how we actually pull out individual cards, I want to talk about it kind of at a high level. So let's jump forward, like, a hypothetical six weeks to the end of January, and Kaldeheim spoilers are coming out. And, you know, we've just found out about, the, hey, this new cool card is here, and this, you know, neat card that will fit in a bunch of my decks. How do you start preparing for that? Max, for example, when you start seeing cards that show up that you're like, oh, that's going to be good in this deck. Is there anything you do to start, like, the process of finding cuts or, or, or making notes about cards that are interesting to you? Um, Not really. So, like, when preview season starts, you know, I'll make note of you know, hey, this this card would be really good in Dramoka because it's a, you know, a 5-5 five, five flyer for four and maybe has some weird conditional clause to cast it or whatever. I mainly just pay attention to cards that are going to, you know, go into the themes of my deck. So Dramoka flying, Abomination of Land War, you know, I'm, I'll be looking for elves. Brago, I'm looking for stuff that does really cool enter the battlefield stuff. So I kind of start at that high level and just find the stuff that fits thematically into my decks and just make a mental note. Okay. It's probably not till later in the preview season or even closer to release where I really start digging into like, okay, these three cards, I want to, 
maybe try in Brago, and this one might go into Dromoka. But I really don't worry about the nitty gritty right away during the initial preview uh, season, you know, when we get two or three previews a day for a couple of weeks. Now, are, are you watching those previews pretty closely over the course of the day? Or do you just like check in at night as, you know, the, the day has finished and see hey, what came out today? How, how closely do you watch that during the average uh, preview season? I would say I probably watch it pretty close just because, uh, you know, I have our, our community and our Slack open, you know, on my sure. computer. So I see the, the little dings going on in the, the preview channel. So I try to stay active in that. Otherwise, you know, at the end of the workday or in the evening, I'll scroll through that and see what I missed all day, you know, and right. comment on stuff. But no, I, I definitely think I pay attention more than maybe the casual person, but I definitely am not someone that says, oh, preview started on Monday. I guess I should check out what happened. Okay. How about you, Chris? How, how closely do you monitor that or, or what do you do about cards that you see that catch your eye? Uh, if I see something that catches my eye, I usually take a screenshot of it. I have a folder on my phone in my notes section that has, you know, like deck ideas or card adding or whatever. Um, as for actually watching the previews, I don't. I kind of okay. avoid it until the full set comes out, and then I do a deep dive once the full set comes out. Because as I've said numerous times, I only play a couple of colors, so that's all I look sure. at. I don't care about <laughs> the other ones. So, and then I just go from there. Okay. I'm usually monitoring things pretty closely for one part of the way my job works is I'm, I'm at a screen all day long. And for the most part, I, I'm not I'm usually not like dialed in, into anything that requires perfect focus all the time. I tend to do a lot of either I'm in a meeting where I can just like listen for my name or listen to my turn and don't need to maybe pay that close of attention. Or I'm working on a thing that requires me to pay close attention for 10 or 15 minutes and then wait a few minutes for somebody else to do something. Or, you know, I can, I can move on to something else. So I usually have time over the course of my day to kind of hop around and like, okay, what has happened in the last half an hour? So I can kind of monitor things closely and just out of kind of boredom or whatever to keep my you know mind entertained. I, I do tend to keep a pretty good track on things over the course of a day. So when a new spoiler comes out, I'm usually pretty aware of it pretty quickly. I have an Excel spreadsheet where I log <laughs> changes I make to my decks. And that does sound kind of silly, but it is useful. So what I do is if a card, you know, is revealed, I'm like, oh, that's obviously a, you know, there's a new Sphinx that just came out. That's that's going to be good in my Sphinx deck. I'll, uh, that's an obvious include. You know, I'll open up the spreadsheet and, and make the new tab for that expansion. And it's got my decks already in it. So I'll just basically usually copy a previous sheet that I had already used and just delete the data from that previous, whatever the, the set was. Okay, well, I'll, I'll write the name of that Sphinx down in next to my Sphinx deck. And I'll just make a few notes like, here's what the CMC of it is. You know, it's a creature or whatever. I've got a few fields there that I can note. And that's it. I'll, I'll just like throw it on there because... By the time the, the two-week period is done, it's pretty easy to have forgotten a card that caught your eye earlier. So I'll make a note of it, first of all. And then usually, like Chris had said, when everything is all said and done, I'll go back through and kind of do the deep dive. Because there's always stuff that either, number one, didn't get spoiled. You know, thinking in years past, stuff like um, Village Rights. I don't think was previewed. It was a really good, you know, sacrifice a creature, draw a card or draw two cards. I don't know if anyone had that for a preview, but it's almost always like one or two of those commons or uncommons that don't get previewed and wind up being pretty effective. So it's always good to go over the full spoiler list or even a card that like is good that your brain didn't catch on. I remember us talking about this a few years back when Heroic Intervention was in the Kaladesh, I believe. Aether Revolt. Aether Revolt. Okay. I, my brain just didn't click on it. And it, like, for whatever reason, I read the card and the text didn't, like, what the card did didn't register in my brain. And in that case, it didn't register until, like, six weeks later. But that still kind of happens once where I'll read a card and I'll be like, oh, that's fine. And then I'll forget about it until I do the reread and I'm like, oh, that's better than fine. It's really, really good in this particular deck. But, like, it didn't dawn on me right away. So doing that reread after the full spoilers are out, spending, you know, half an hour going over all the cards is useful just to do that. And then I'll start filling in that spreadsheet. Okay, well, there's a new Sphinx, obviously, in my Sphinx deck, and I'll make sure it's still in there. And there's a cool new Death Touch creature, Elvish Dreadlord, that might work pretty good in Glissa. I'll add that to my Glissa deck. And we got a couple of new good dual lands. I'm going to put that in this deck and that in this deck. So I'll add them all to that spreadsheet. And then I can use that, you know, as I'm making changes later on to, okay, this is what I'm pulling out, so I'll add it to that sheet. I'm replacing, you know, War Room is going into my Athreos deck, and it's going to replace Reliquary Tower or something. So then I'll make the notes in there before I even make the change. That way, when it comes time, I can, like, order my cards or whatever. I'll just go to that list of my spreadsheet, order them all, and when they come in, I can then mark them as done on that spreadsheet. So, hmm. 
and that sounds complicated, but it like isn't that time consuming. You know, it's the, the spreadsheet's already designed. I just make a new tab and, and type the name in, and it's that sounds like way more ridiculous than it really is. You've also been doing it forever, so you know you're Absolutely. used to it. Well, and, and it's also a thing where like when you have ten decks, you kind of need a process, or, yeah. or you're just gonna gonna wind up in in three months when you look at your deck, you're like, oh, somehow I'm at 102 cards in this deck and didn't realize it. So it, it's also a way to keep from making those kind of mistakes. I don't ever go up in cards. I actually go into duplicates of cards. Yeah, I, well, I've, <laughs> like, I've caught that I cast before this card too, but yeah. <laughs> like three turns later, I draw a card and I'm like, oh, no one saw that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I've done that too. I think I went a whole year with two two copies of a card in Dramoka and I never, it took a whole year for me to draw both of them in a game. Yeah. Yeah. It's called Teferi's Protection. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, and, and I'm even a little bit more paranoid about that right now, particularly playing on stream and stuff. Like, because it's one thing when you're, you know, playing with your buddies at your house and you, you know, realize you have two copies of Mindstone in your deck. But like, I would be really paranoid to look like I'm trying to cheat or something if it happened on a stream when there's like 150 people watching it on Twitch. So I, I'm kind of doubly concerned to not make that kind of mistake just for that reason. <laughs> I want to look like a jerk. <laughs> well, honestly, if that were to happen on stream and someone you know, lost their mind about it. You just got to look at them just be like, come on, man, we're all human. We make mistakes. We're not perfect. Well, and also like, if I'm going to cheat, it wouldn't be two copies of Mind Stone or something. <laughs> yeah, it'd be like two mana drains right. or, or in Max's case, two Teferi's protection. Yeah, you know it. Go. Or you just have the mods block them from the chat. It's fine. That's you know? true. There we go. Yeah. So let's get a little more specific here talking about, about the lands in particular. And those are kind of an easy one because they tend to be a one-for-one one replacement where you put in a land and take out a land. <laughs> so not always, I guess. But like at this point, most of my decks are old enough that like the, the land balance is kind of set. You know, maybe early on, I'll start at 38 lands and go down to 37 and then decide like six months later, now yeah, 36 would be fine. I can try that. But for the most part, I've... I've made those changes in my deck, so I'm kind of happy with where the land balance is. But like, you know, Zendikar Rising, we just got that cycle of uh, dual-faced cards, the, the, the mono dual-faced lands that are pretty decent, and we're going to get more of those this spring. And, you know, Commander Legends, we just got the enemy cycle of, battle, of, of the Battle Bond lands that are all really good, too. So when it's time to put in a new dual land like that, and I'll, I'll ask you, Chris, how do you figure that out? Do you just look at your list and be like, well, this land is the worst one in the deck, or do you pull up basics, or how do you, how do you figure that out? I guess it's going to vary on exactly what your deck's doing. Okay. Like for me, I ended up adding like Field of the Dead to a lot of my decks. So it's easier to cut basic lands for another dual land because you need more of that, you know, X amount of lands to trigger Field of Dead, that kind of fun stuff. Okay. Now for other decks that aren't running something like that, then you just look at the dual lands and you go, okay, this one's trash. Like uh, I still run a guild gate in Mogus because I want as much red black sources as possible because it's pretty evenly split between red and black. Now with like the battle bond land, you know, I already have it in Mogus. So then it's like, well, okay, you know, if I get another one, what do I start cutting? You know, I, sure. I guess I cut the guild gate, I guess, and go from there. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. How about you, Max? Any any kind of rough outline you have here for how you make changes particularly to lands? This is actually probably one of the more challenging things for me to cut when tinkering with my decks. I actually kind of just went through this um, with Commander Legends and a little bit of Corset. I finally picked up a bunch of Fable Passages just because they were relatively monetarily inexpensive. Sure. So, like, with the Battle Bond lands... Those were pretty easy to slot into the decks that didn't have them. So like Regna and Krav, I ended up cutting Caves of Koilos because about a month ago, I actually cut the Tainted Land, you know, the Tainted Peak, Tainted, all those. If you control yep. a swamp, it taps for two colors. I cut most of those for Fabled Passage because I found out that the way my mana split is, it was more heavy non-black. So there were a lot of times where I wasn't getting the value of it being a dual land. So Sure. Hmm. I swapped that to go for a fetch, and then I, I'm now removing, like, the pain lands for the battle bond lands. And that's kind of exactly what I did in Tuvasa, that being three colors and getting a new battle bond land for that, for Bant, uh, getting the, the Simic one, I just cut Yavamaya Coast. You know, it, the battle bond land still comes on untapped 95% of the time, and right. it doesn't hurt me when I tap for man colored mana. That's kind of how I justified that. That makes sense. Yeah, and, and I kind of do something similar to that that both of you guys do there as well. Although I think it's going to change moving forward because up until now, there tended to be at least one or two lands in most of my decks that came into play tapped sometimes or often enough that it was clearly probably the worst land of the bunch in the cycle, whether it was like the Ravnica Bounce lands, I still I think had one in a deck or 
the Shadows what? of Innistrad. You still have one of those in I the did. deck? Um, and it was a deck wow. where I had two different, I think it was in my blue-black deck, that had a Bajuka Bug and a Halimar Depths. So like okay. occasionally it was useful in addition to like bounce a Bajuka Bug to recast it. Yep. So I still had one of those. I still had like one or two of the Shadows of Innistrad lands. I had like a couple of the Amonkhet cycling lands because they're fetchable. So like one or two of my green decks had, a, had some of those cyclers. I think I still had a Theros Temple. Actually, I think the Theros Temple was also in the deck with the the bounce land because like okay I'll, I'll replay it and get a second scry out of it if I need to later on in the game so I had a few of those things that that you know are usually kind of a tempo hit because they come into play tapped and that's been usually my go to okay well I I've I got these new the new battle bond lands hey this deck is still running a Theros temple that's an easy pull pull the temple I'll put this in it always comes into play untapped there we go. I'm kind of out of those though. <laughs> like particularly this time going through when I added the battle bond lands, I don't have many of those tapped lands left and there's not going to be an easy, well, I'm just going to pull all of the Innistrad lands out because I don't have any of those anymore in any of my decks. As of the last temple I just pulled for the MDFC land, I'm out of temples too. So like at this point, I don't quite know how I'm going to do these changes moving forward because there's no really obvious lands to cut. And I'm already running pretty lean on basic lands in most of my decks. I'm at, you know, I think 12 in most of my decks. And I really don't want to go lower than that because then I'm just going to get wrecked by a Blood Moon or back to basics. You know, as it is, 12 is a relatively low number. And I definitely don't want to go below it, so I, I'm just going to have to, maybe the, the, the check lands are next, or maybe the, I, I don't know. I, I, I already wasn't running the fast lands either, so I just, uh, something is going to have to give, but I, I haven't figured out what that is. Hmm. Honestly, if I were to choose, in your case, Dana, you just said check lands versus fast lands. I would cut fast lands first over check lands due to the simple fact of check lands are fetchable. Yeah. So you could always, you know, if you if you are playing fetches, now I'm not saying that everyone does, but if you are, it's still a fetchable land that's a dual land. I don't think the checks, the check, the checks aren't fetchable. No. They are the basic land type. Are they? Yeah. They're, They're the like ones dragon that are the basic skull summit. Type. Yep. Oh, you're talking about those. I was thinking yeah. of the ones that... Um, Battle for Zendikar lands. Yeah, the ones that come yeah, into play okay. untapped if you control a SWAT or no, right? Yeah, those are, those are the Battle yeah. for Zendikar ones. Okay. And in those, they're going to finish, and those I tend to like, and at some point they'll probably finish that cycle too, so that'll be another <laughs> five that we have to find room for in those decks as well. So, yeah, I don't even know. I, I'm Don't it, listen to Dana, everybody. Just cut basic lands. <laughs> there we go. Play with you. Just well, know every time I'm playing red, I have Blood Moon. And, so. and, and I do think like some people that are, <laughs> like if you're running 18 or 20 basics or something, unless you're playing with your one friend who has a Blood Moon all the time, you can afford, like, I don't think you need to stay at 18 basics. I think you're perfectly fine going down to like 16 or 14. So some people do have room to, to do that, but I am not one of them. <laughs> So um, for me, I, I think cutting basics is not a safe choice. So utility lands, and we talked about them a little bit, but like War Room just showed up in Commander Legends, and I play mostly monocolor or dual color decks where it's a really good card. So I think I wound up putting it in like nine different decks. <laughs> And again, the temptation here is to replace a basic or replace usually a basic, but I don't have room to do that. So I wound up replacing utility lands with utility lands. And going over my spreadsheet, here's what I wound up pulling. I replaced uh, Teetered Peaks, which is one of those ETB tapped lands that buffs a creature until end of turn. So I use that in my Voltron deck. Um, I replaced a Reliquary Tower, uh, Mist Veil Plains, Tainted Wood, which Max mentioned are the ones that require a swamp to do a thing. Prismatic Vista, Homeward Path. Castle Lockthwain, Reliquary Tower, and then an island in a swamp. So the, there are two decks I did replace basics, but I will note those are a mono blue deck and a mono black deck. So I'm still sitting at like 25 non basics or yep. 25 basics in those decks. So in, in my decks that were two colors, I did not replace basics. I had to replace utility lands. Is there anything you guys really pay attention to when, like, like Chris, you mentioned adding Field of Dead to a bunch of your decks. Did you replace Utility Lands, or did you happen to have a room in those decks to pull out a basic or something else? Hmm, I'm trying to think what I pulled out of those decks. I, I don't keep track of what I pulled. Okay. But if I had to guess, I probably pulled another Utility Land or a Dual Land of some sort. But I maybe I pulled a basic... I know with those, the decks that I did that in, I did swap the whole basic chain around, so there are more basics in it because I'm running, like, snow-covered basics and all that stuff sure. now, too, so... Otherwise, yeah, if I were to put, just slap a utility, let's say I'm looking at someone's deck and they want to put War Room into a deck, the first thing I'm going to look at is probably their other utility lands or lands that create colorless mana. That's the other big one. Yeah. Like, um, 
we'll we'll take like caves of coleos or something like that for instance it does create colorless but also pains you at the same time right well i'm gonna look at it as a colorless land and say hey you know we could replace this for this you're still getting the colorless aspect out of it yes you lose the colored mana but you're not taking pain plus you're getting the upside of the other ability so i mean it could be a one-for-one swap pretty easily okay how about you max yeah, I, I definitely start with other utility lands, so I'm kind of looking through. I put, I've put i put War Room in two of my multicolored decks so far, so Dromoka got one and Regnankrov got a copy of it. And in Dromoka, I swapped out Throne of the High City, and mm. it was pretty much just the, the rationalization of for Throne, you had to pay four and sacrifice it to become the Monarch, right. where... And who knows, you might lose the Monarch. You know, if you make the play mistake and do it at the wrong time, you could lose the Monarch before you even draw, where right. War Room is just three mana and two life to draw a card, no matter what. So that was just kind of a, I hate to use this term, but strictly better upgrade, in my opinion. Yeah. In a deck that really didn't do anything with the Monarch. For Command Beacon in Regnankrov, I took out High Market because I looked at my list, and although High Market has that sacrifice outlet on it, which, yep. you know, my deck kind of needs, so do my command, one of my commanders and a bunch of other sure. cards in the deck. So I thought, you know, I have enough redundancy to where I'd rather have a card that gets, you know, Regna out of the command zone when she costs 12 and right. be able to let her, I mean, cast her for six type of thing. Yep. I was thinking more long, long-term long game plan than in, like, short-term, I need, I need an answer now type of thing. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and again, I, my plan is is very similar to all of, all of that as well. Like Chris said, it does depend on the deck to a degree too. You know, I mentioned one of the decks I took Homeward Path out. That was a deck where like in looking at it, I only have a few creatures. So Homeward Path is still good. There's still plenty of times I've absolutely screwed up somebody's plans by having that untapped when they're either their commander steals a bunch of stuff or they just are, you know, trying to reanimate something from someone's graveyard and they can't attack me with it or I'm just going to tap Homeward Path. It's a, I think it's a really good, decent card. But in that particular deck where I didn't have to worry about saving my own creatures, it was just trying to cause chaos elsewhere, that made for an easy cut. Whereas if I was playing a deck where, like, my commander was a super important part of what I was doing, then maybe I would not have cut the Homeward Path because it was important in that deck. So it's it's... Not a situation with utility lands where you just take all of one thing out and put, you know, all of this thing in. So that one, I, I, I agree, tends to be much more flexible in terms of making those decisions. So moving past the lands, which tend to be kind of, I, I think, easier, at least for me to make cuts. How about the other things? Are there any kind of rough guidelines you have for replacements? And, and I'll start with mine, for example. I try to replace a role with a role. It doesn't have to be a card type necessarily, but like I try to I try to match the CMC. I try to match what the card does usually. So if I'm replacing a, you know, five CMC attacker or if I'm adding a five CMC attacker, I try to replace a five CMC attacker or if I'm adding a ramp spell that costs two mana, I try to replace a ramp spell that costs two mana or at least costs more than the one I'm replacing. You know, it doesn't have to be that way, but like if it's possible, I try to do that. So when I added Sphinx the Second Sun to my Sphinx deck, I replaced Chancellor of the Spires. They're, they're both creatures, they're both attackers, and both have similar CMCs. When I added Jessica's Will to my Mina and Den deck, uh, Sprouting Vines did kind of a similar thing, putting cards in my hand, same CMC. When I added three visits to that same deck, I replaced Sakura Tribe Elder, because that's not a deck that does much reanimation, and I felt like being able to get the land untapped was more useful to me than the once in a while Steve would be a chump blocker. Yeah. So, you know, one's a creature, one's a sorcery but they're both doing a similar thing so that's kind of the rough framework i try to do when i make replacements is there anything max start with you that you try to do when you're looking to make the swaps for non-land slots so yeah i kind of follow what you do i i mainly try to swap cmcs i'm not too particular about card type unless i know the deck is already kind of low on a specific card type so dromoka is a great example of that where i only run you know 18 creatures in the mm -hmm. deck and that's not so 19 with dromoka so when i was doing a bunch of commander legends changes to this deck i really made sure that for something like archon of coronation which is a six mana flyer that you know gains me life I really wanted to swap a creature out for that or another spell. What I ended up cutting was like Dromoka the Eternal because the two Dromokas were the only dragons in the deck. So I figured Archon just does more for me all around because sure. a lot of the creatures in the deck have lifelink. So like I get its ability of, you know, I become the monarch and as long as I'm a, the monarch, I don't, damage doesn't cause me to lose life. So that's great. Yeah, it was a, 
It was a bump up in CMC from five to six, but it was a body. And that's really all I cared about. Sure. In other changes, though, like I added three visits and an arcane signet and a court of grace and a slash the ranks and a chrome as well. That's where I kind of just look at CMC. So like okay. arcane signet is got swapped out for I, I wrote rampant growth because I think what I did is I, I do these one at a time like, OK, here's here's three visits. Well, Luminarch Ascension is what I technically have written down is what I cut for three visits two mana. And I got a ramp spell versus something that has been a dud over the past X amount of games, I've I've drawn it, you know, because it, it it's a it's a an aggro causing card. It makes people attack me. You know, you really have to be situ- set up to really use that card. Sure. You know, Court of Grace. I that's four mana. I cut Return to Dust because you know, granted, Dramoka has a lot of removal. Maybe I have too much. Is what I'm starting to realize as I've been playing with this deck with other people and you know i'm the guy that kind of makes for bad tv if i'm casting removal after removal after (laughs) removal yeah no that's that's legit i've 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 felt that way before too where i'm like oh i can't just be playing police here right so i mainly just try to stick to cmc i really don't care about functionality so like another example would be i cut hour of promise which was a ramp spell that gets me any two lands for mm-hmm. a, a Chroma's Will, which is a four mana instant that quite possibly is going to win the game. Or at least save all of your stuff. It does both of those things. Right. And I actually, in my notes, I have, I decided to cut Hour of Promise over Piers Wim because Piers Wim at least has that pseudo removal clause in it that may or right. may not help me. More often than not, I'm going to get someone to sacrifice an artifact or enchantment. Um, where Hour of Promise, I don't run any other deserts in the deck, so I'm not getting that zombie token. Yeah, you're, you're almost always going to generate some kind of value with Pierce Whim. Right. But for, I'm, and again, it just comes down to what the deck is trying to do. So like in Brago, I kind of leaned into more mana rocks. And uh, the biggest thing I added was Amphin Mutineer uh, to the deck. That's the one that when it ETBs, I can exile on any creature and they get a 3-4 Amphibian, uh, you know, a, a Salamander token, I think. Mm-hmm. I actually cut Duplicant for that because it was a, a reduce in casting cost. And the the Amphin can hit anything where Duplicant couldn't hit tokens. So I could hit a Merit Lage with the... the the Amphin Mutineer, I couldn't do that with Duplicant. Okay, that makes sense. But yeah, that's pretty much kind of how I just do things is CMC first, and then if the co- the deck is short a specific card type where I know I don't want to go under X amount of creatures, then I really try to make creatures for creatures, or maybe there is a, a six mana sorcery that just doesn't do it for me anymore, and I can put a creature in for that. How about you, Chris? Any, any kind of r- rough guidelines you have for the changes you wind up making for these slots? Not entirely. Like, mainly what I do is, if I find a nice sorcery, I'm going to want to replace a sorcery in the deck, because I don't want to change the tempo of how the deck plays. Like, you know, sure. if the deck's meant to be played, you know, at instant speed, or have cards that are, you know, instant speed castable, I don't want to start replacing those with sorcery, so I'm stuck on my turn doing it. Usually, what I end up doing is cutting creatures. And I know it's wrong to do, but I usually end up cutting creatures because... In my most of my decks that I play, aside from Alesha, creatures don't make that much of a difference compared to, you know, any other spell. Like, the spells just give you way more value than what the creature actually does, unless it's, like, a Twilight Prophet or something, you know, some broken right. card that does a lot for you. That's not broken. <laughs> <laughs> it's not broken, I know. It's the first card that popped in my head, because it's really, it's an extremely powerful card. <laughs> So that's usually what I do. Sometimes I have caught myself cutting like mana rocks and stuff out of the deck, especially when it seems like I'm oversaturated in like mana sources. Okay. Um, Big one is like Mogus. I've been looking at him a lot. You know, I'm running 36 lands plus I think I have like eight mana rocks or 10 mana rocks or something in there. So it's like, well, I can start cutting some of those, but then I start looking at, well, that's going to change the speed of the deck. Right. The other thing I look at too is, and this is, I'm going to bring this up from what you were saying, Dana, with the cards that you replaced. Um, and we'll go with, uh, we'll say the Sphinx cards. Now, I don't remember what the pips are on them, but that's the other thing I look at. You know, let's say I'm replacing a double black pip card for a double red pip card. That actually ruins my mana base. It means I have to start swapping out like certain lands here or there to get back onto that right curve of each color. Now, I don't know if that's something that you guys look at, but it's definitely something that crosses my mind and probably happens more often because of playing competitive. You want to always be on mana curve. You want the right color mana when you need it, not having to fight and look for it. 
Yeah, I, I'm definitely aware of that. That's one of the columns in that spreadsheet of mine next to the, the, the name of the creature. So like next to in my Sphinx deck in the, the column where I have Sphinx of the Second Sun, you know, 6UU is written down. That way when I'm looking at creatures, I'm like, I don't want to try to replace, I probably don't want to pull out, you know, Argent Sphinx or something that that is four mana. Um, I want to be looking at like Chance for the Spires, even though it's a perfectly good card. It also is, you know, four blue 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 so somewhere casting yep. costs same amount of pips or at least close enough that i'm comfortable yep. making that swap without messing up my curve so I, that's absolutely something I'm, I, I try to keep an eye on whenever possible yeah it's not like a supreme verdict swapping it out for a one mana white right. wrath or something and you're just like well i just lose all those blue pips or whatever yeah. you know so and if you go down, I don't worry about it. Like if I if I happen to be pulling out something that costs five and put in, like oh cool, I'm gonna put replace this five drop with a three drop. I usually then I'm like that that's fine. I don't I definitely don't mind going down, but I try to avoid going up as much as possible. Yeah, it's something that always crosses my mind. You know when I'm swapping out cards is like so after you know like most of us are we've been playing our decks you know five six years mm-hmm. wherever we're at now. I don't even probably longer than that. I don't know. I'm getting old, so time just all blends <laughs> together now. But I mean. <laughs> you know after when you start swapping in new cards it's like your mana base has already been set and it's been perfect and now you got these new pips and all of a sudden you're going to start noticing that you know well i was let's say heavy red in my deck or something but now i'm turning into heavy blue in this deck so now i gotta change all my mana base over again yeah it definitely be something you have to watch for if, if you're not cautious because you could all of a sudden find out that you know your deck is now yeah like you said really heavy in one colors when it wasn't six months ago just because of the changes you've made when you just by swapping you know four blue cards for four white cards if the blue cards that came out happen to be you know single blue pips and the white ones you added happen to mostly be doubles that really can throw off the balance it sure can. That's something so, to keep in mind when you're yeah. doing it. And and even just in general, like I, you know, I, I talked about keeping an eye on the, on the, you know, replacing a four CMC for a four CMC. But even if you do that, even if I'm replacing, if I replace a blue card for a white card, okay, it's just one card. But if I do that every time a new set comes out, then after a few months, I, or after, a, you know, maybe not a few months, maybe after a year, if I've replaced like five cards that way, that also throws it off. So like even just doing the one card can be... Uh, a problem if that compounds over the course of you know x amount of time exactly so that's a, that's a good point there chris kind of like a summary of, of things to look at here when you're making changes are there any more thoughts anyone has kind of as, as a as a wrap-up or a summary here of things to keep in mind when you're making these these shifts the one that jumps out at me i mean this actually came up on stream the other night when i was talking to the the folks at mtg nexus about cutting a card that you feel like hasn't done much in your deck when the reality is you just haven't seen it enough <laughs> or, or even seen it at all because i've caught myself doing that where i'm like well this is an easy cut and it actually just happened i replaced castle lockthwain with war room and it, it's a logical cut so good <laughs> yeah um but the deck where i replaced it was a two-color deck okay and it, it got a, it was a little trickier to get you know good value out of it there versus war room so what wound up happening was my first thought was castle really hasn't done much for me in this deck so i'm gonna replace it and the second thought was, well, I've only drawn it once. I've literally only seen it once in that deck because I just haven't played it that much. And of course, if you don't play it that much, if you play it again deck three times and you don't, the odds are pretty good. You're not going to see one card. I still think it was the logical swap in that deck because I do a similar thing. And I think Worm is slightly better for what it does. But it wasn't because Castle Lock Queen didn't perform. It was because I just haven't seen it. And that's a really easy thing to do in your own head to just immediately be like, this card's trash. I'm pulling it out. It hasn't done anything for me because you haven't drawn it at all. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. that's, that's one thing I would suggest to watch out for because I've, at least myself, I've caught myself doing that before. See, you know, I get caught in the backwards loop of that, of looking at a card and, you know, reminiscing on past games with that card. Like, this card was so good, it did this, it did this, it did this. When in actuality, that card's really not as good as you thought it was. It just happened to be really good at that moment and just blew the game up and all that fun stuff, which... I got a couple of those cards in my Mogus deck that I'm still hold on to that I should oh, probably sure. cut, but it's just like, no, I remember, you know, back 10 years ago or whatever <laughs> when I was playing this card. And <laughs> Well, I mean, to a degree, that is the kind of thing that happens with, like, card prices. You know, Tarmogoyf was a great card in Modern for a whole lot of years, and even if it maybe isn't right now, it still maintains that price memory back when it was an absolute bomb in that format. 
even though it's been printed like seven times. Right. <laughs> At the time when it was worth, you know, $130, it was a powerful card in the format and it had one printing. Now yep. it's no longer the powerful card it once was and it's had, you know, 11 different printings. But, however, it's still a relatively expensive card because the way people's brain works, it maintains that price memory. The same thing absolutely happens with how good a card is. You think back to that, you know, the couple great games you had with it early, you know, the, when you first used it. And even if it may not have performed that well since then, your brain still remembers those good times, like you said. So that's a really good point. Yep. There's also cards. Um, I'm actually looking at my Mogus deck right now to keep in mind, like uh, I play Toil and Trouble and this card can be a blowout card. And this is one of the cards that's on my chopping block right now as a what if, you know, it's a what if you know this card i can go so ham with this card but half the time when you play the card it does minimal to nothing when you could have a card that does the same but costs less and just way better in the long run how about you max any any final thoughts here on this i i definitely agree with chris that i definitely have had the issue of i know i want to cut this card but it did this awesome thing the last time i played the deck so maybe it should stay and you know it takes a lot of willpower to be like no just because it did something good once out of the last 25 games doesn't mean it deserves the sp- spot on the roster, essentially. Or you see somebody else do a good thing with a card, <laughs> and, and despite the fact that you can't get it to, perf- to to do that in your deck, you still like think back to that time that person did this like twice. And you're like, man, but it was so good when they played it. That that's like your relation with seasons past. Kind of, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It never quite works for me, but man, you always blow me out <laughs> it, with it. It works on every for everyone else. I've always <laughs> everyone seen it work for me, everybody. Is what you're saying. Yeah, well, maybe. yeah. Um, my my other point, final note here is don't be afraid to reverse the cut. Like yeah, I think I'll get into that. this more next in the next in next week's show. But there was a card from Commander Legends I was super hyped on. Um, and I put it into three of my decks, and one of my decks I've been playing a lot. Every time I've drawn the card, and I've seen it maybe five or six times, it's a card where it's like, geez, if I cast this, I'm just helping you know me and one other player, and not really gaining much advantage from it so sure after drawing that card multiple times and probably only casting it once i cut it i cut it out of the deck and put something else in there that i wanted to try from commander legends or a card i found in one of the icoria precons yeah i i've encountered that before um especially with cards that that vary from deck to deck um my talran deck i'm running midnight clock Mm-hmm. which is that the mana rock from from Eldraine, where after three turns on the board, basically it gives you a one-person wheel. Mm-hmm. So, hey, th- that's great in that Tauran deck because it's really easy to empty my, okay, I do Midnight Clock. Great, I'll play it. I'll use it for mana rock. I'll quick empty my hand out because the, the, the CMC in the deck is really low. It's got a bunch of cantrips. Super easy to do. Comes back to me. I'm down to one card. Boom, I'm back up to seven. However, I was trying it in my uh, Kedis and Crom deck where I, you know, mentally I'm like, heck, card's so good in Talrand. I'm going to put it in here for sure. That deck doesn't play that way. The deck wants to take one big turn. And what wound up happening was I would draw it and look at it and look at my hand and be like, well, I want these cards all in my hand and I don't want to use them for three turns. And if I play that Midnight Clock right now, I'm not sure if it's going to line up where it's going to go off before I've got a chance to do all the things I want to do. And multiple times, I would draw that Midnight Clock and find myself in that same situation where, like, I didn't want to play it because I needed to keep those cards in my hand for something I was planning on doing a couple turns down the road. But I kept it in the deck, and I, and I encountered that because it was so good in my Talran deck, I really didn't want to cut it out of my blue red deck because mentally in my head I kept thinking but it's so good in that deck <laughs> and that's that's a kind of a tough thing to get past sometimes and that's a good example of where I kind of struggled with that and, and it's out of the deck now I, I pulled it because there was just the amount of times it didn't work for me was way more than the amount of times it did work versus my tower end deck where it worked every single time yep now that is you know something that's probably dawning on me right now about that is for those of you who run you know 12 15 different decks you're going to run into that issue way more yeah. than us who only run like three or four decks you know because there's so many of them that you have and you're just like oh this card is so good and you put it in that deck it's like well i guess it's not really that good and then you think about it in the other deck you're like well do i cut it out of this deck and then you're into <laughs> sure. that conundrum and you're like oh god no <laughs> well sure yeah I, I guess i didn't even think of that but like right that can go backwards then if you you put it in the deck where it doesn't work then does it make you start doubting it in the previous deck so yeah sure. yep. <laughs> you can definitely overthink a lot of this kind of stuff All right. Well, I I think that is kind of going to wrap up what we have to say here about making cuts. I hope that was a a little bit useful to listeners out there, 
given the crazy amount of cards we've just gotten in in 2020 to add to decks. And realistically, I don't know if that's going to change much moving forward. You know, no, yes, this it's was not. <laughs> this was the year of Commander, I guess. But like, what's going to be different next year? We have the same amount of sets. They're still putting a ton of legends in all these sets. So I guess instead of Commander Legends having 70 new legends in it, we're going to get uh, you know Modern Horizons 2, which is going to have 20 new legends and everything else will be the same. <laughs> so I, I don't know if 2021 is going to be much different in terms of having to make changes to decks other than there'll be a few less legend. There's going to be the same amount of cards, I would guess. So prepare yourselves for this being maybe the new normal moving forward where there's just a lot of cards all the time that you have to consider for your decks. Joy. Or you just leave your deck the same. Yeah. Or you just leave it the same. I mean, hey, I get it. If you want to do that, I would totally get it because it's a lot to deal with. And you're just like, hey, look at this old card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Remember this yeah. one? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us this week. We'll be back next week with another show. Uh, you can find me on Twitter birds at Dana Roach. You can find Max at CMDR Central underscore Max. And you can find Chris at Wise Squishy One. Our podcast theme is Retro Future Dirty by Kevin McLeod. And our podcast is edited by Raphael Garcia. You can find him on a Twitter at Ursa Bearwalker. And if you are looking to have any editing work done, hit him up there. He is um, always looking for new opportunities. So he He's a fantastic editor, and it does great work for this show. And if you're looking for something, um, he comes highly recommended from us. Yes. We'll be back next week. Until then, I am Dana. I'm Max. And I'm Chris. Chris.